All rise, vous vous levez. The International Criminal Court is now in session. L'audience de la Cour pénale internationale est ouverte. Please be seated. Vous vous asseoir. Thank you very much, photographers. Oh. Um, court clerk, please call the case. Thank you, Madam President. The situation in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in the case of the prosecutor versus Mathieu Ngojolo, ICC 0104. 0212. We are in open session. Thank you. I am Sanji Munaring, presiding judge in the final appeal proceedings in the case of the prosecutor against Mr. Ngujulo Chui. Seated directly to my right are Judge Song and then Judge Korula. To my direct left, is Judge Tafosa and then Judge Tanda Filova. Today, the appeals chamber is delivering its judgment on the appeal of the prosecutor against the decision of trial chamber two, entitled, and I quote, judgment pursuant to article 74 of the statute, end of quote. In today's summary, I will refer to the impugned decision as the acquittal decision. Please note that only the written judgment is authoritative and not the summary. It will be notified to the parties shortly after this hearing. In terms of the procedural background and briefly, on 18th December 2012, Trial Chamber 2 delivered the acquittal decision. The Trial Chamber acquitted Mr. Ngujulo within the meaning of Article 25.3a of the Statute of the Crimes Against Humanity of Murder, Article 71a, Sexual Slavery, Article 71g, and Rape, Article 71g of the Statute which were alleged to have taken place in Bogoro, the Democratic Republic of Congo, on the 24th February 2003. On the 20th December 2012, the prosecutor filed a notice of appeal against the acquittal decision. On the 19th of March 2013, the prosecutor filed her document in support of the appeal against the acquittal decision. Mr. Ngujulo filed his response to the document in support of the appeal on 19th June 2013. And on the 18th of July 2013 and 22nd of July 2013, victims groups one and two filed their respective written observations. On the 29th July 2013, the prosecutor filed her reply to Mr. Ngujulo's response to the document in support of the appeal. And on the 28th August 2013, Mr. Ngujulo filed his response to the prosecutor's reply. On the 21st of October 2013, the appeals chamber held an oral hearing to hear final submissions on the appeal. In this appeal, the prosecutor raises three grounds of appeal. Under the first ground of appeal, she alleges errors in the trial chamber's application of the standard of proof 
which is beyond reasonable doubt. Under the second ground, the prosecutor alleges errors in the trial chamber's evaluation of the total of the totality of the evidence. And under the third ground of appeal, the prosecutor raises an alleged procedural error which she argues violated her right to have a fair trial. I shall address each ground of appeal in turn. Um, you will notice that I have not asked the parties and, uh, and participants to introduce themselves. This will be done at the end of the delivery of this summary. Ground one, this is relevant to the misapplication of the standard of proof. The prosecutor's first ground of appeal refers to several of the trial chamber's factual findings, which in her view show a consistent pattern in the analysis of the evidence, whereby the trial chamber effectively entertained any doubt, including doubt not based on evidence, reason, logic, or common sense. The victims, too, make similar observations with respect to other factual findings of the trial chamber. Given the numerous factual findings in dispute under this ground, the appeals chamber will not address each of those alleged errors in this summary. However, all the alleged errors are addressed and fully reasoned in the actual judgment on this appeal. The prosecutor avows that under the first ground, she is alleging errors of law. Nevertheless, the appeals chamber considers that to the extent that the alleged errors are based on challenges to the trial chamber's factual findings, her arguments will be assessed against the standard of review for factual errors. In this respect, the appeals chamber determines that it will apply a standard of reasonableness when assessing an alleged error of fact, thereby according a margin of deference to the trial chamber's findings. The appeals chamber will only intervene if it finds that no reasonable trial of fact could have failed to make the particular finding of fact beyond reasonable doubt, and the acquittal relied on the absence of this finding. The first alleged error relates to witness P317, a United Nations employee who testified inter alia that during her investigations on the situation in Ituri, she met Mr. Ngujulo in April 2003, at which point he stated that he had organized the attacks on Bogoro and Mandro. The prosecutor's arguments with regard to witness P317 focus on the purported speculative finding of the trial chamber that Mr. Ngujulo may have lied in his alleged admission to witness P317 in order to advance his career. The prosecutor submits that the trial chamber refused to rely on the evidence of witness P317, and I quote, because in the chamber's view, it could not be excluded that Mr. Ngujulo lied to the witness and that he may possibly have wanted to claim responsibility to enhance his career. The prosecutor further submits that the trial chamber post two other lesser justifications for refusing to credit Mr. Ngujulo's admission, namely that the alleged admission was too general to permit the court to determine Mr. Ngujulo's precise status and role within the Bedou Ezekere group more, 
and that the alleged admission was inconsistent with another admission he had made several weeks later to a Congolese prosecutor. The appeals chamber finds the prosecutor's arguments here to be unpersuasive. The appeals chamber knows that the trial chamber stated that Mr. Ngujulo's alleged admission to witness P317, although somewhat indicative of the accused's possible involvement in the preparation of the attack on Bogoro, was too general ultimately to determine the accused's precise status and role in the Bedu Ezekere group more. It then went on to find that furthermore, it could not be ruled out that Mr. Ngujulo had wanted to claim responsibility for an attack so that he would be given a higher rank if integrated into the regular Congolese army, but did so while specifically stating that this argument must be treated with caution. Thus, the appeals chamber finds that, contrary to the prosecutor's arguments, the conclusion that the alleged admission was too general for any definitive determination of the accused's role was the trial chamber's primary finding with the speculative explanation of Mr. Ngujulo's possible design for career advancement being subsidiary. <coughs> As regards the reasonableness of the trial chamber's finding that Mr. Ngujulo's alleged admission to witness P317 was too general for a conclusive determination of Mr. Ngujulo's role, the appeals chamber notes that the trial chamber found the witness credible and stated that it could rely on her testimony. The appeals chamber notes, however, that Mr. Ngujulo's alleged admission appears in said testimony almost in passing. It was by no means the focus of the witness's testimony. She merely mentioned that Mr. Ngujulo said he had organized the attacks on Bogoro and Mandro for strategic reasons. In light of the foregoing, the appeals chamber finds that it was not unreasonable for the trial chamber to conclude that the alleged admission as reported to witness P317 was too general for a precise determination of Mr. Ngujulo's status and role in the Bedu Ezekere group more. Regarding the trial chamber's alleged speculative explanation that, and I quote, it cannot be ruled out that Mr. Mateo Ngujulo akin to others in Ituri at the time, had wanted to claim responsibility for an attack so that he would be given a higher rank if integrated into the regular Cong Congolese army. The appeals chamber knows that although Mr. Ngujulo never attempted to justify his alleged admission to P317 in this manner, and in fact simply denied ever having met the witness, he did provide such an explanation with regard to his admission to a Congolese prosecutor. Furthermore, the trial chamber referred to the testimony of witness D0311, the FNI president, who testified that he had falsely claimed responsibility for the attack on Bogoro. The appeals chamber considers that in so doing, the trial chamber provided some evidentiary foundation for the possibility that Mr. Ngujulo may have wanted to claim responsibility for an attack so that he would be given a higher rank if integrated into the regular Congolese army. The appeals chamber finds that when viewed in this light, the trial chamber's findings are not speculative, but rather demonstrate that, based on similar evidence on the record, it was unable to rule out other explanations for Mr. Ngujulo's alleged admission. Accordingly, the appeals chamber considers that the trial chamber's finding was not unreasonable. 
and rejects the prosecutor's arguments in this regard. The next alleged error relates to the trial chamber's findings on the attack on Bunia on the 6th March 2003. During the trial, the prosecutor sought to establish that Mr. Ngujulo held the position of leader of the Lendu combatants from Bedu as a Kere group more, who attacked Bogoro on 24 February 2003. To this end, the prosecutor introduced evidence relating to events in the period following the attack on Bogoro, such as the attacks on Mandro on 4 March 2003 and Bunia on 6 March 2003. In her closing brief, the prosecutor submitted that Mr. Ngujulo's alleged role during these attacks can only be explained by the fact that he was the leader before the attack on Bogoro. It is in this context that the attack on Bunia was assessed by the trial chamber in the acquittal decision. The prosecutor's arguments under this section essentially challenge the three findings underpinning the trial chamber's primary finding, that it could not establish beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Ngujulo directed the Lendu combatants during the attack on Bunia. In the prosecutor's view, these findings are further examples of the trial chamber requiring proof beyond any conceivable doubt and thereby misapplying the standard of proof. In arriving at his primary finding, the trial chamber examined a statement given by Mr. Ngujulo when being interviewed by a Congolese prosecutor. In the statement, when asked whether he was ever present during military operations, Mr. Ngujulo replied that he directed only the operation that took place on 6 March 2003 in Bunia. In this regard, the first finding that the trial chamber made is that Mr. Ngujulo, and I quote, appears to claim leadership of the entire operation, whereas everything points to the Bunia offensive, having been led by the UPDF and the Lendu combatants, end of quote. The prosecutor claims that the trial chamber's finding here is speculative and impressionist, impressionistic and supported by no evidence. The appeals chamber finds that the prosecutor's arguments in this regard are unpersuasive. Given the plain meaning of the words used by Mr. Ngujulo when being interviewed by the Congolese prosecutor, it does not appear incorrect to hold that he appears to claim leadership of the entire operation. In the view of the appeals chamber, it was not unreasonable for the trial chamber to make this observation, given that there was undisputed evidence that the attack on Bunia was actually led by the UPDF with the assistance, assistance of Lendu combatants and that Mr. Ngujulo could therefore not have had overall responsibility, a point that the prosecutor concedes. With regard to the trial chamber's second finding, the appeals chamber considers that the trial chamber simply reinforced its first observation when it added that Mr. Ngujulo also did not indicate which troops he led. The appeals chamber considers that the trial chamber's reasoning does not, as such, indicate that it required too, existing, too exacting a standard of proof, but merely further explains why the chamber was not convinced by Mr. Ngojulo's admission to the Congolese prosecutor. Accordingly, the appeals chamber considers that the trial chamber's finding in this respect was not unreasonable. The prosecutor further disputes the reasonableness of the trial chamber's related finding that Mr. Ngujulo's admission to witness P317 was inconsistent with his subsequent statements to the Congolese prosecutor. 
in that Mr. Ngujulo made no mention of the latter of his participate in the latter of his participation in the battles of Bogoro and Mandro. The prosecutor argues that the finding essentially required the two admissions to be fully symmetrical before the trial chamber could find them to be reliable. She further argues that it was unnecessary for the chamber to expect that an admission by the accused of one attack would necessarily have to mention the accused involvement in other attacks. The prosecutor raises these arguments in two different contexts. One, with respect to the trial chamber's findings on the attack on Bunia and Mr. Ngujulo's alleged admission to the Congolese prosecutor. And two, with respect to the trial chamber's overall conclusions at the point of its collective evaluation of Mr. Ngujulo's admissions to witness P317 and the Congolese prosecutor. The appeals chamber is not persuaded by the prosecutor's arguments. The trial chamber did not require the two admissions to be fully symmetrical. Rather, it noted that they differed. In the view of the appeals chamber, the fact that two admissions that an accused person made were not identical is a relevant consideration that a chamber may take into account when evaluating the evidence. Given the trial chamber's other findings that underpin its primary finding, the appeals chamber finds that there is no indication that the trial chamber gave undue weight to the differences between the two admissions. Second, with respect to the trial chamber's evaluation of Mr. Ngujulo's alleged admissions to witness P317 and to the Congolese prosecutor in its overall conclusions, the appeals chamber knows that while not impugning the credibility of the sources of either alleged admission, the trial chamber found itself compelled to note a certain inconsistency between these two items of evidence, such that, and I quote, the first one fails to mention Matthew Ngujulo's participation in the Battle of Bunia, and the second does not mention his participation in hostilities at Bogoro and Mandro. Accordingly, the trial chamber held that it was compelled to treat such revelations with circumspection. In the view of the appeals chamber, this approach of the trial chamber was not unreasonable. As noted above, differences between two admissions of an accused person are relevant to the evaluation of the evidence and may therefore be taken into account by the trial chamber. There is no indication that the trial chamber gave undue weight to this factor. In this regard, the appeals chamber also recalls that um, the trial chamber's primary finding concerning Mr. Ngujulo's alleged admission to witness P317 was not unreasonable. Furthermore, the trial chamber found that in view of Mr. Ngujulo's alleged admission to the Congolese prosecutor, it cannot rule out the possibility that he led the Lendu combatants from Bedu as a carer during the Bunia operation, but is nonetheless unable to do so to so determine beyond reasonable doubt. The appeals chamber considered, considers the trial chamber's finding in this regard not to be unreasonable. The appeals chamber therefore rejects the prosecutor's submissions, which fail to establish that the trial chamber incorrectly applied the standard of beyond reasonable doubt. Likewise, with respect to the remaining errors raised under this ground of appeal, the appeals chamber finds the findings of the trial chamber to not be unreasonable. And as a result, the appeals chamber concludes that it has not been established that the trial chamber was misinformed of the standard of beyond reasonable doubt or applied a standard that was too exciting. Accordingly, 
the prosecutor's first ground of appeal is rejected. With regard to ground two, the alleged failure to consider the totality of the evidence, under this ground of appeal, the prosecutor alleges that the trial chamber adopted a wrong approach at each of the three different stages of the decision-making process when it A, assessed the credibility of the evidence, B, made factual findings, and C, reached its final decision on the guilt of Mr. Ngujulo. To demonstrate the purported errors, the prosecutor provides a limited number of examples at each stage of the decision-making process, which, according to her, were critical to the trial chamber's refusal to find that Mr. Ngojulo led the Lendu combatants of Bedu Ezekere, who attacked Bogoro on 24 February 2003. As under the first ground of appeal, since the prosecutor uses examples of alleged factual errors to demonstrate the alleged legal error, the appeals chamber will analyze these examples against the standard of review applicable to factual errors. Again, for the purposes of this summary, not all of the alleged errors will be addressed. In relation to the trial chamber's credibility assessment, the appeals chamber will focus on the errors alleged by the prosecutor with respect to the trial chamber's assessment of the credibility of witness 250, P250. The appeals chamber notes that the prosecutor relied on the testimony of witness P250 to establish inter alia Mr. Ngujulo's role as leader of the Lendu militia that attacked Bogoro on 24 February 2003. Witness P250 claimed to have been a militia member within the military structure of the Bedu as a career group more and testified, testified inter alia that he was a member of a delegation dispatched from Zumbe by Mr. Ngujulo to Mr. Katanga in Aviba, where the decision to attack Bogoro was made. Witness P250 described the strategy implemented to win the battle, in addition to details of the various itineraries followed by the commanders. The trial chamber rejected witness to P250's evidence in its entirety on the basis that the witness's evidence was imprecise and contradictory. In particular, the trial chamber relied on school reports which tended to indicate that witness P250 was a student at the relevant time and could therefore not have been a militia member. The arguments raised by the prosecutor which are broadly underscored by those of victim group two, focus on the alleged failure of the trial chamber to consider various pieces of evidence in the record, which, according to the prosecutor, tend to corroborate aspects of witness P250's testimony that established Mr. Ngujulo's authority in Bedu as a career. In the prosecutor's view, when rejecting witness P250's testimony in its entirety, the trial chamber failed to consider how his evidence related to and undermined the evidence of defense witnesses. This, the prosecutor argues, demonstrates the trial chamber's failure to consider the entirety of the evidence which it found witness to P250 lacked when it found witness P250 lacked credibility. The appeals chamber considers that, as the prosecutor herself pointed out, a trial chamber may indeed rely on certain aspects of a witness's evidence and consider other aspects unreliable. The appeals chamber further finds that the evidence of a witness in relation to whose credibility the trial chamber has some reservations may be relied upon to the extent that it is corroborated by other reliable evidence. However, the appeals chamber also finds that there may be witnesses whose credibility is impugned 
to such an extent that he or she cannot be relied upon, even if other evidence appears to corroborate parts of his or her evidence or testimony. The Appeals Chamber considers that in relation to, P, to witness P250, the trial chamber found the latter to be the case. In the trial chamber's view, witness P250's credibility was impugned to the extent that it affected his capacity to testify to the facts in issue, and his evidence became entirely divested of reliability. Accordingly, even though parts of witness P250's testimony appeared to have corrob been corroborated by other evidence, this would not, as correctly suggested by Mr. Ngojulo, re-imbue his credibility or the reliability of his evidence. While a trial chamber should indeed assess the credibility of a witness in part by assessing whether the content of his or her testimony is confirmed by other evidence, the trial chamber is not required to find a witness to be credible, simply because other evidence appears to confirm the content of aspects of his or her testimony. In particular, if there are other reasons for doubting the witness's credibility, it is not per se unreasonable for a trial chamber to reject potentially corroborative evidence when making its credibility assessment. In the present case, the appeals chamber knows that the trial chamber had doubts that witness P250 was a member of the Bedou Ezekere militia. And since his entire testimony was pre premised on the fact that he was a member of the militia, the trial chamber found that it could not rely on his evidence at all. In light of the foregoing, the prosecutor's argument that um, numerous examples of testimonial evidence, as well as the soap letter, show that aspects of witness P250's testimony were corroborated by other witnesses, and that therefore, witness P250 should have been relied upon fails to establish that the trial chamber's findings were unreasonable. The prosecutor's arguments are therefore <coughs> rejected. Finally, <coughs> the prosecutor argues that the trial chamber failed to take into account relevant evidence and facts when it assessed the credibility of the defense witnesses and the reliability of their accounts that witness P250 was not a member of the militia. In particular, the prosecutor submits with respect to witness D03100 that even though the trial chamber acknowledged that the witness and his family had been in conflict with Mr. Ngujulo's family, it nevertheless ignored the fact that witness D03100 refused to give a direct response to repeated questions about whether his testimony was unaffected by the conflict. In this regard, the appeals chamber knows that the trial chamber found that the witness himself, <coughs> this is DO 3100, <coughs> spontaneously volunteered the information that had been, that there had been a, a conflict between the two families. The appeals chamber further knows that the trial chamber considered this acknowledgement to be an indication of the witness's attempt at transparency and that it should be taken into account when assessing his credibility. In addition, the trial chamber considered the impact of any possible <coughs> tension or threats from Mr. Ngujulo's family on witness D03100 by comparing his testimony with the testimony of other witnesses that contained useful information about witness P250 schooling in the years 2002 to 2003. In the trial chamber's assessment, 
given that the evidence of the four defense witnesses mutually corroborate, um, was mutually corroborative and convincing, since they hailed from different environments, their accounts reinforced the credibility of witness DO 100 statement that witness P250 was a student at the material time. In light of this, the appeals chamber finds that the trial chamber did not ignore the possible effect of threats on witness DO3100's DO3 evidence. Rather, the appeals chamber finds that the trial chamber carefully examined the evidence of other defense witnesses to test the reliability of witness DO 3100's testimony. Accordingly, <clears throat> the prosecutor's arguments that <clears throat> the trial chamber's findings were unreasonable are therefore rejected. For similar reasons, the appeals chamber rejects the arguments of the prosecutor in relation to other credibility assessments of the trial chamber in relation to documentary evidence and witness testimony. Accordingly, the prosecutor's arguments in relation to the first stage of the trial chamber's decision-making process are rejected. As to the second stage of the trial chamber's decision-making process, the prosecutor challenges the correctness of the trial chamber's approach to the fact-finding process throughout the acquittal decision. To demonstrate the alleged error, the prosecutor refers in alia to the trial chamber's assessment of hearsay evidence, referring to the trial chamber's findings regarding witness DO2176. The trial chamber, in the context of assessing the evidence related to the position held by Mr. Ngujulo, before and during the attack on Bogoro, noted the testimony of witness DO2176, who stated that, and I quote, he knew very well that Mr. Ngujulo was the number one and commander of operations during the attack on Bogoro. According to the trial chamber, witness DO2176 stated it to be a and I quote, truth known to all, end of quote. While the trial chamber acknowledged that witness DO2176 was, and I quote, well placed to state which military commanders were at enemy positions, given that UPC troops had attacked Bedou Ezekere Group more on numerous occasions, end of quote, the chamber nonetheless held that his assertion was and I quote, founded on anonymous hearsay made by an individual who did not live in Zumbe and who provided no further details on Mr. Ngujulo's status within that locality, end of quote. Furthermore, having examined witness DO2176 statement, the trial chamber held that it, and I quote, could not rule out that the witness had associated, associated Mr. Ngujulo's status in the FNI with the position which he considered him to have held prior to the attack on Bogoro, end of quote. The prosecutor argues that the trial chamber disregarded evidence or facts when it rejected witness D02176 statements. In the prosecutor's view, witness D02176 had direct knowledge of the Ebedu Ezekere Lendu commanders, some of him whom he attended school with in Bogoro. Furthermore, the prosecutor avows that in finding that the witness did not live in Zumbe, and therefore his evidence could not be accorded much probative value, the trial chamber failed to take into account that, although not from Zumbe, the witness lived in close proximity and, like all Bogoro residents, had an interest in knowing who led their enemies. The appeals chamber knows that the trial chamber assessed 
witness D02176 testimony in conjunction with that of other witnesses who testified to the position held by Mr. Ngujulo prior to the attack on Bogoro and concluded that it could only attach very low probative value to this evidence as a whole. The trial chamber reached this conclusion on the basis that one, most of the testimony was hearsay. <coughs> Two, it came from witnesses who were not actually present in Bedu as a career group more prior to the Bogoro attack. And thirdly, it provided very little detail on the authority purportedly held by Mr. Ngujulo or on the manner in which he exercised it. Moreover, as the trial chamber pointed out in stating that said evidence must be treated with circumspection, and I quote, it relates to a crucial point in the prosecution's case, end of quote. The appeals chamber considers that none of these findings are unreasonable. With respect to the specific evidence or facts that the prosecutor alleges the trial chamber aired by failing to take into account, the appeals chamber knows that this evidence appears to relate to one, events that took place after the attack on Bogoro, two, events that um, the trial chamber already otherwise discussed, and three, statements that the trial chamber found to lack specificity, to have any meaningful probative value or for evidence as to why witness DO2176 might, in theory, have been well placed to know what was going on with his enemies in the Bedu Ezekere group more. The appeals chamber finds that, at best, the prosecutor is putting forward a possible alternative interpretation of the evidence but she has failed to establish any error on the part of the trial chamber that would render the chamber's approach unreasonable. Accordingly, the prosecutor's arguments are rejected. For similar reasons, the appeals chamber rejects the arguments of the prosecutor and the victims in relation to other alleged errors with the trial chamber's fact-finding process. Accordingly, the prosecutor's arguments in relation to the second stage of the trial chamber's decision-making process are rejected. Finally, the prosecutor contends that as a result of the errors alleged in the first and second stages of the trial chamber's decision-making process, the chamber's ultimate conclusion on the guilt or innocence of Mr. Ngujulo was therefore vitiated by these legal and factual errors. Having rejected the errors, the prosecutor has, the errors that the prosecutor has alleged in relation to the first and second stages of the fact-finding process, the appeals chamber does not consider it necessary to address the, prosecutor, the prosecutor's argument in relation to the sta third stage, as she has raised no separate argument. The appeals chamber therefore rejects the prosecutor's second ground of appeal. Um, now, the third ground of appeal, the, um, the, the, this is to do with the prosecutor's right to have an adequate opportunity to present her case. Um, this ground relates to the trial chamber's management of Ms. Tangujulo's alleged interference with witnesses and victims while in detention at the court. Under the third ground of appeal, the prosecutor admits that the trial chamber committed critical errors in its management of the trial that materially affected the prosecution's right to present and prove its case, thereby violating the prosecution's right to a fair trial under Article 64.2. More specifically, the prosecutor admits that the trial chamber, and I quote, aired in procedure by refusing the prosecution's persistent requests and by failing to exercise its own powers to ensure the fairness of the trial proceedings, end of quote. Preliminarily, 
the appeals chamber will address whether the trial chamber's decisions on the telephone monitoring are res judicata and therefore may not be raised in the context of this appeal. Mr. Ngujulo contends that all decisions by the trial chamber on the issue of monitoring his telephone calls are res judicata and that res judicata <coughs> constitutes a ground of inadmissibility. In particular, he argues that because the prosecutor already unsuccessfully requested leave to appeal the trial chamber's oral rulings on telephone call monitoring and was specifically denied the, the right to use this material when examining witness P250, the prosecutor should be barred from rehashing a matter that has been def definitively resolved. Mr. Ngujulo argues further that the issue concerning the monitoring of his telephone calls was never the subject of adversarial proceedings and as such cannot be considered to be evidence discussed at trial for the purposes of Article 74.2 of the statute. The Appeals Chamber finds that Mr. Ngujulo's argument that the decisions the trial chamber rendered during the proceedings are as such res judicata is not persuasive. The principle of res judicata, which is well established in international law, is defined as, and I quote, a matter that has been adjudicated by a competent court and which therefore may not be pursued further by the same parties, or as a thing adjudicated, meaning that once a lawsuit is decided, the same issue or an issue arising from the first issue cannot be contested again, end of quote. The Appeals Chamber recalls that in the context of interlocutory appeals, it has held that procedural errors that may have risen, arisen prior to an impugned decision, but which are germane to the legal correctness or procedural fairness of the Chamber's decision, may be raised on appeal. For reasons more fully explained in the judgment of this appeal, the Appeals Chamber considers that the aforementioned also applies if the impugned decision is a decision under Article 74 of the statute. The Appeals Chamber considers that to decide otherwise would indeed, as submitted by Victim Group 1, deprive the parties of the ability to raise procedural errors in final appeal proceedings. In the view of the Appeals Chamber, this is irrespective of whether the proceedings before the Trial Chamber took place on an ex parte basis or not. As a consequence, Mr. Ngujulo's argument that the relevant proceedings were not adversarial need not be further considered. Accordingly, Mr. Ngujulo's arguments on res judicata are rejected. Now, turning to the merits of the third ground of appeal, the prosecutor submits that the trial chamber committed a procedural error by, and I quote, by refusing the prosecution's persistent requests and by failing to exercise its own powers to ensure the fairness of the trial proceedings, and that this error violated the prosecution's right to a fair trial <coughs> under Article 64.2. The prosecutor further submits that, and I quote, disregarding the broad powers afforded to it by the statute, the trial chamber took no action during the proceedings to ascertain whether critical witnesses had been intimidated and whether others may have colluded to provide false testimony. In so doing, the trial chamber disregarded its own authority to manage the trial and at least as importantly, its obligation to arrive at the truth, and that as a result of the cumulative effect of the Chamber's decisions and its passivity, the prosecutor's right to a fair trial under Article 64.2 was violated. In support of her contention, the prosecutor submits that in light of the, and I quote, clear and probative value that Mr. Ngujulo and third persons acting on his behalf has, 
had disclosed the identity and the evidence of protected prosecution witnesses, orchestrated a consistent line of defense evidence and exerted pressure over witnesses, end of quote. The trial chamber committed critical errors in its management of the trial. More specifically, the appeals chamber understands the prosecutor to allege that the trial chamber made three errors when it, one, prevented the prosecutor from getting full access to Mr. Ngojulo's recorded conversations, two, rejected the prosecutor's request to use the parts of the registry reports that she had access to in order to examine Mr. Ngojulo and witness D0388, and thirdly, improperly prohibited the prosecutor from eliciting explanations from witness P250 regarding the inconsistencies in his testimony. Before addressing the, these arguments, the appeals chamber will address Mr. Ngujulo's argument that the prosecutor is not entitled to raise alleged violations of fair trial rights. In this regard, the appeals chamber recalls that the prosecutor couches her arguments broadly as violations of her fair trial rights. The prosecutor submits that her right to a fair trial is guaranteed under Article 64.2, and that this right obliges the court to ensure that neither party is put at a disadvantage when presenting its case. The prosecutor vows that the right to a fair trial involves, in particular, her right to, and I quote, exercise the powers and fulfill the duties listed in Article 54 to have the genuine opportunity to present her case, as well as to be in a position to tender evidence free of any external and or undue influence and to question witnesses comprehensively." End of quote. The Appeals Chamber recalls that the right to a fair trial is a fundamental right protected at the regional and international levels. It is commonly understood that the right of a, to a fair trial, fair or fair hearing, in criminal proceedings, first and foremost, in yours to the benefit of the accused. Indeed, the specific rights entrenched in Article 67.1 of the statute are specifically tailored to the needs of the accused person. The appeals chamber does not consider it necessary to determine whether and to what extent the prosecutor has a right to a fair trial in the abstract. What is at issue <clears throat> is not the overall fairness vis-a-vis -vis the prosecutor. Rather, at issue is a fundamental aspect of the trial, which touches upon the core functions of both the prosecutor and the trial chamber, namely the objective of establishing the truth, as well as the prosecutor's ability to present evidence in order to prove the charges against the accused. With regard to the latter, Article 69.3 of the statute provides that, and I quote, the parties may submit evidence relevant to the case in accordance with Article 64. The Appeals Chamber considers that the principle that the parties must be afforded an adequate opportunity to present to present their case must be seen in the context of Article 54.1a of the statute, which enjoins the prosecutor to establish the truth. The establishment of the truth, truth is one of the principal objectives of the statute to which the trial chamber must actively contribute. In this context, the appeals chamber knows that Article 69.3 of the statute gives the court the power to request the submission of all evidence that it considers necessary for the, term, the determination of the truth. Given the trial's, trial chamber's duty to contribute to the establishment of the truth, 
The appeals chamber considers that the prosecutor may raise errors alleging that her ability to present her case has been violated as procedural errors under Article 811 a small i of the statute. Mr. Ngujulo's argument in this regard is therefore rejected. In relation to the prosecutor's argument that the trial chamber did not provide her with a genuine opportunity to, pre to present her case when it refused her full access to the recorded conversations, the appeals chamber knows that by a series of decisions issued by the registrar, the post-factum listening of all non-privileged communications was ordered of both Mr. Katanga and Mr. Ngujulo from the court's detention center as of 1st October 2008. And thereafter, during intermittent periods until 28th January 2010. In parallel, the registrar produced numerous reports analyzing the recorded conversations and alerted the trial chamber to possible witness intimidation and disclosure of confidential information concerning witnesses by Mr. Ngujulo via his outside contacts. The trial chamber reacted by notifying these reports to Mr. Ngujulo and the prosecutor in redacted form. And by taking measures to protect witnesses who may have been at risk, as well as prohibiting on a provisional basis all contact between Mr. Ngujulo and the outside and separating him from other detained persons. For the reasons that follow, the appeals chamber is not persuaded by the prosecutor's argument that the trial chamber aired by denying her full access to Mr. Ngujulo's recorded conversations. The appeals chamber recalls that a trial chamber's decision to grant or deny full access to monitored information pursuant to Regulation 92.3 of the regulations of the, of the court is a discretionary decision. Accordingly, the appeals chamber will consider whether the trial chamber aired against the standard of review for discretionary decisions. According to that standard, and I quote, the appeals chamber will interfere with a discretionary decision only under limited conditions, namely one, where the exercise of discretion is based on an erroneous interpretation of the law, two, where it is exercised on patently incorrect conclusion of fact, or three, where the decision is so unfair and unreasonable as to constitute an abuse of discretion. The appeals chamber notes that the trial chamber refrained from providing full access to the recorded conversations on the basis that such information fell, and I quote, within the purview of Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights or the right to mount, a, to mount a defense, end of quote, which could only be inferred with, and I quote, in accordance with the law, and if necessary, and proportionate to the legitimate aim pursued, end of quote. In this regard, the trial chamber concluded that the, and I quote, necessity requirement was not met, given inter alia, that the prosecutor had not demonstrated how a lack of access to such information would, in this instance, deprive her of any possibility of achieving the objective prescribed by Article 54.1 of the statute. Thus, the trial chamber considered that the prosecutor already had access through the registry reports, and I quote, to all the information of relevance to her and which potentially impacts on witnesses, end of quote. The appeals chamber notes that the registry reports, which contain um, analysis of many hours of non-privileged conversations between Mr. Ngojulo and his outside contacts, were, with the exception of the first report, 
provided to the prosecutor in redacted form. The reports were redacted to safeguard information pertaining to Mr. Ngojulo's private life and or defense strategy, but contained detailed and explicit excerpts from the actual transcripts of the recorded conversations. Furthermore, the appeals chamber observes that the conversations were at times so closely linked to Mr. Ngojulo's defense strategy that the registrar was in doubt as to whether they should be disclosed to the prosecutor. In these instances, the registrar included the information for the trial chamber's evaluation. In view of the above, the appeals chamber is not persuaded that the trial chamber acted unreasonably when it refused to grant the prosecutor full access to the recorded conversations. Rather, the trial chamber balanced the interests of both Mr. Ngujulo and the prosecutor. As such, no error in the trial chamber's decision may be discerned. As to the second argument that the trial chamber aired in refusing the prosecutor the use of the registry reports to cross-examine Mr. Ngujulo and witness D0311, the appeals chamber notes that on 8 July 2011, the prosecutor requested the reclassification of five of the registry reports in order to use them in cross-examination of inter alia Mr. Ngujulo and witness D0388. Relying in particular on the first report, the prosecutor indicated that it was necessary to refer to the excerpts of the recorded conversations. One, to assess the credibility of Italia Mr. Ngujulo. Two, to cross-examine Mr. Ngujulo on his statement reflected in the recorded conversations concerning Mr. Katanga's possible participation in the attack on Bogoro. And three, to prove that witness D0388 was in collusion with Mr. Ngujulo and was biased. The prosecutor argues that since she was prohibited from using the reports to cross-examine Mr. Ngujulo, she was unable to question him, and I quote, on his and his associates' efforts to locate protected prosecution witnesses and their family members quote, in order to pressure them to recant or refuse to cooperate, end of quote, or on, and I quote, his efforts to ensure that defense witnesses presented a consistent and approved line when testifying on his behalf, end of quote. With regard to witness D0388, the prosecutor argues that she was prohibited from demonstrating that the witness lied when he testified that he had only spoken to Mr. Ngujulo once when Mr. Ngujulo was in the detention center. The appeals chamber considers that the determination of the truth is a central aspect of any criminal trial, to which not only the prosecutor, but also a trial chamber is under an obligation to actively contribute. The appeals chamber further considers that a trial chamber's role in this regard is heightened in circumstances where the chamber is aware of possible efforts to distort witness testimony or the truth-finding process. The appeals chamber observes that in, case, in the case at hand, the prosecutor was seeking to use the registry reports, in particular the unredacted first report, the disclosure of which the trial chamber had authorized to elicit from Mr. Ngujulo and witness D. 0388, whether witnesses had been intimidated, <coughs> coached, or <coughs> otherwise induced to testify in a certain way. The appeals chamber considers that the fact that the information contained in the registry reports was obtained for another purpose, namely the protection of witnesses and safeguarding the non-disclosure orders of the trial chamber through the monitoring of Mr. Ngujulo's non-privileged telephone conversations from the detention center does not per se preclude its use during the trial. The appeals chamber notes in this context 
that the registry reports had previously been screened as regards their content. Information considered to relate to Mr. Ngujulo's private life or his defense strategy was withheld from the prosecutor and consequently could therefore not have been used during cross-examination. In addition, the trial chamber could have resorted to closed session if it considered that there were legitimate reasons as to why some or all of the information should not be in the public domain. In that case, only the other parties and participants who would have been legally obliged to respect the classification of the information would have become privy to such information. In these circumstances, the appeals chamber finds that by denying the prosecutor the opportunity to use the registry reports in the trial to cross-examine Mr. Ngujulo and witness DO 388, the trial chamber placed undue weight on the need to protect Mr. Ngujulo's rights as opposed to the need to establish the truth. Accordingly, the trial chamber exercised its discretion unreasonably and therefore erroneously. As to the third argument that the trial chamber improperly prohibited the prosecutor from eliciting explanations from witness P250 regarding inconsistencies in his testimony, the prosecutor submits that during his testimony, witness P250, and I quote, retracted several confined but critical statements <laughs> contained in his pre-trial statements such as the presence and deaths of civilians during the Bogoro attack, the presence of child soldiers under the age of 15, the existence and the content of songs that the Bedou Ezekere group sang before attacking Bogoro, and the destruction of properties during the Bogoro attack." End of quote. The prosecutor recalls that she requested an opportunity to refresh the witness's memory and to put his prior statements to him in order to clarify the inconsistencies in his testimony. However, the trial chamber rejected her request. On a subsequent occasion, the trial chamber again rejected the prosecutor's request, stating that the witness could not be described as hostile because he had answered with precision a great majority of the questions put to him by the prosecutor and that evasive answers or answers minimizing previous statements did not justify a declaration of hostility. The prosecutor admits that as a result of these rulings, in respect of which she had unsuccessfully sought leave to appeal, they, and I quote, trial chamber improperly prohibited the prosecution to show witness P250's prior statements or to ask him leading questions without declaring him hostile, in order to enable him to explain the reasons underlying his inconsistencies, whether his retractions were mistakes, true changes in recollection, or the result of threats or other improper pressure exerted about, upon him <coughs> and his family." End of quote. The appeals chamber finds merit in the prosecutor's argument insofar as she argues that in circumstances where witness P250 expressed fear for the safety of his family, the trial chamber at a minimum should have allowed the witness to be examined by the prosecutor in order to ascertain whether his demeanor and retractions were due to threats or other improper pressure exerted on him or his family. In this regard, the appeals chamber observes that during the trial and under cross-examination by the defense counsel, witness P250 stated that he had told the prosecutor in prior statements that persons close to him were dead because he was afraid for their lives. The witness explained further that he had only said that to avoid the possibility that someone would be sent subsequently to kill them. The appeals chamber knows that the witness did not substantiate why he believed that his family could be in danger, but offered this explanation as to why he was contradicting prior, his prior statements. 
In these circumstances, the appeals chamber considers that had the trial chamber allowed the prosecutor to put leading questions to witness P250, the trial chamber would ultimately have been enlightened as to whether the discrepancies between the witness's pre-trial statements and his oral evidence were indeed due, as suggested by the trial chamber, to, and I quote, such factors as the lack of familiarization procedures by the parties themselves at the court, the witnesses traveled to The Hague, the formality of the hearings, and the ordeal of cross-examination, end of quote, or potentially the passage of time, or whether, in fact, other factors may account for those discrepancies. Accordingly, the appeals chamber finds that the trial chamber should have allowed the prosecutor an opportunity to put witness P250's prior statements to him and allowed her to ask the witness leading questions to elicit the effect, if any, of any interference or pressure that may have been exerted on him. By failing to do so, the trial chamber exercised its discretion unreasonably and therefore erred. <coughs> the appeals chamber recalls that for the appeals chamber to reverse or amend a decision under Article 74 of the statute or to order a new trial before a different trial chamber, it is not sufficient for the appellant to establish that an error occurred. In accordance with Article 83.2 of the statute, it must also be demonstrated that the decision appealed from was materially affected by that error. In this regard, <clears throat> the appeals chamber has stated that as part of the reasons in support of a ground of appeal, <clears throat> an appellant is obliged not only to set out the alleged error, but also to indicate with sufficient precision how this error would have materially affected the impugned decision. In the view of the appeals chamber, this requirement is explained by the fact that a trial chamber's decision at the end of what will often have been a lengthy trial should not be disturbed lightly. In particular, in the case of an acquittal, it is not justifiable to put the person through the ordeal of a new trial or even to reverse the acquittal and enter a conviction unless it is shown that the error indeed materially affected the decision under review. The appeals chamber knows that the standard is high. It must be demonstrated that had the trial chamber not erred in procedure, the decision under Article 74 of the statute would, as opposed to could or might, have been substantially different. In the circumstances of this case, it has to be established that there is a high likelihood that the trial chamber, had it not committed the procedural errors, would not have acquitted Mr. Ngujulo. The appeals chamber recalls that it has determined that the trial chamber committed a procedural error when it refused to allow the prosecutor to use the registry reports to impeach Mr. Ngujulo and witness D0388. The appeals chamber has further determined that the trial chamber erred by not allowing the prosecutor to put witness P250's prior statements to him or to ask the witness leading questions in order to enable him to explain the reasons underlying the inconsistencies between his pre-trial statements and his in-court testimony. With respect to the first error, the prosecutor submits that the error materially affected the acquittal decision because she, ha she was prevented from showing collusion between Mr. Ngujulo and witness D0388. The appeals chamber notes that the prosecutor's argument does not actually address the material effect that the error had on the acquittal decision in the manner I've just described. Rather, the prosecutor's argument merely refers to the consequences of the procedural error on the proceedings. Regardless, for the reasons that follow, the appeals chamber finds that it cannot be said that the trial chamber's error materially affected the acquittal decision. The appeals chamber considers that the trial chamber made pertinent observations regarding witness D0388 
and Mr. Nkujulo's behavior when questioned about their contact with each other while Mr. Nkujulo, while Mr. Nkujulo was in the detention center. The trial chamber concluded that given their behavior, and I quote, a degree of, of caution, end of quote, had to be applied when assessing their evidence. Furthermore, the appeals chamber notes in particular that the trial chamber emphasized that a great deal of caution had to be applied to those parts of witness DO 388's testimony concerning Mr. Ngujulo's liability. By applying caution in this assessment of their testimony, the appeals chamber finds that the trial chamber addressed the impact of any possible collusion between Mr. Ngujulo and witness DO 388. It is clear from the acquittal decision that the trial chamber did not attach much, if any, weight to witness DO 38's testimony as far as Mr. Ngujulo's liability is concerned. In other words, witness DO 388's testimony appears not to have had any impact on the trial chamber's finding that Mr. Ngujulo's individual criminal, criminally criminal responsibility, sorry, uh, that Mr. Ngujulo's individual criminal responsibility for the attack on Bogoro has not been established beyond reasonable doubt. With respect to the error concerning witness P250, the prosecutor submits that the acquittal decision was materially affected because the trial chamber rejected the evidence of witness P250 as not credible without considering that the witness and or his family had been threatened or pressured and the effect that such pressure had on his testimony. The appeals chamber considers that the trial chamber's failure to allow the prosecutor to elicit the effect of any interference or pressure that may have been exerted on witness P250 may indeed have substantially affected the trial chamber's observations concerning the witness's demeanor and many contradictions in his testimony. However, the appeals chamber knows that ultimately the trial chamber's rejection of P250's testimony as unreliable was based on other findings of the trial chamber that were independent of its observations on the witness's demeanor. In this regard, the appeals chamber observes that the trial chamber, while acknowledging the inconsistencies in witness P250's testimony, rejected his testimony on the basis of other evidence, which cast doubt as to whether the witness was a member of the militia between September 2002 in July 2003. More specifically, the trial chamber concluded that the witness could not have been simultaneously, and I quote, simultaneously a militia member in Zumbe and a student in Kagaba, end of quote. The witness's testimony was therefore deemed to be unreliable for this reason and not because of his demeanor. Thus, the appeals chamber considers that the trial chamber's findings as to the witness's lack of credibility would not have changed because its decision not to rely on the witness was based on other evidence. Accordingly, the appeals chamber finds that the trial chamber's errors had no material impact on the acquittal decision. In sum, the appeals chamber by majority Judge Tafosa and Judge Trendafilo for dissenting confirms the acquittal decision and rejects the appeal. I shall now give very briefly, uh, uh, I shall now very briefly summarize the dissenting opinion of Judges Tafosa and Trendafilo. Having considered carefully the grounds of appeal raised by the prosecutor, the impugned decision and the case record of the entire proceedings, we cannot join the majority in their findings. The appeal subjudicate involves fundamental questions which have a bearing not only on the present case, but more importantly, 
on the course operations for the years to come. We dissent from the majority on all three grounds of appeal, save for the preliminary findings which the appeals chamber was called upon to address. Our dissent follows a reverse order due to the nature of the errors identified and their impact on the acquittal decision. Starting with the third ground of appeal, we disagree with the majority in viewing the purported errors restrictively, namely as a mere alleged violation of Article 54.1 of the statute. In our opinion, the errors raised under this ground of appeal pose a broader fundamental issue of fairness of the proceedings under Article 64.2 of the statute. This said, we are of the opinion that the trial chamber aired by its consistent pattern of preventing the prosecutor from having full access to Mr. Ngojulo's recorded conversations and by denying the prosecutor's request and or requests to rely on the registry reports in cross-examining Mr. Ngojulo and some of the witnesses in the case. These errors not only have an adverse impact on the fulfillment of the prosecutor's duties under the statute, but more importantly, they reveal an inexcusable violation of the duty of the trial chamber to establish the truth. This finding is also germane to our disagreement with the majority on the second ground of appeal. The majority did not find an error in the methodology applied by the trial chamber, which assessed the evidence in isolation. As a result, trustworthy, coherent, and vital evidence was disregarded to the, de to the detriment of the establishment of the truth. Finally, we are in disaccord with the majority on the first ground of appeal. By contrast to the majority, we are of the view that the trial chamber erred in applying a standard of proof beyond any doubt, in entertaining forced doubt, as well as in embracing a speculative approach in reaching some of its findings. In view of the foregoing, we believe that the trial chamber committed a series of errors which materially affected the acquittal decision. Therefore, it is our strong belief that the majority should have amended or reversed the trial chamber's decision and ordered a new trial before a different chamber. Now, as I observed earlier, for the record, I will ask the parties to introduce themselves, starting with the Office of the Prosecutor. Madam President, uh, for the Appellant Prosecutor, uh, I'm James Stewart, uh, Deputy Prosecutor. I'm accompanied by Helen Brady, a Senior Appeals Counsel, Eric MacDonald, Senior Trial Lawyer, Beinhold Galmetzer, Appeals Counsel, and Priya Narayanan, Appeals Counsel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the defense of Ms. Tangujulo. Merci. Merci, Votre Honneur, euh, Mesdames et Messieurs les Juges. La défense de Mathieu Ngujolo a aligné, comme d'habitude, à ma droite, le professeur Jean-Pierre Fofé Jofia Maléwa, qui est notre co-conseil. Juste derrière lui, vous avez Monsieur Bocolombe, qui est notre assistant juridique et qui est chef de travaux au département de droit pénal et criminologie de l'Université de Kinshasa. À ses côtés, Madame Maria Mariam Manolescu, qui est notre gestionnaire de dossier, et moi-même, Jean-Pierre Kilenda Kakengi Basila, avocat au barreau de Bruxelles de Kinshasa Gombe, conseil principal de Mathieu Ngujo. Les Legal Representatives of Victim 1, Group 1. Bonjour, Madame euh, le Président. Je suis Maître 
fidèle ou Kansita. Je suis accompagné par mon assistante juridique, Madame Aline Deleae, qui est avocate au barreau de Paris, et de Madame Nadia Galinier, qui est notre case manager. Je vous remercie. Thank you, sir. Legal representatives for victim group two. Madame le Président, Mesdames, Messieurs les Juges, je suis Maître Jean-Louis Gélissen. Je suis accompagné par ma case manager, Maître Julie Goffin, qui est avocat au barreau de Bruxelles. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much. Mr. Registrar, your team, please. Good morning, Your Honor. I'm Von Hebel, Registrar, and with me is Father Safala Sila, a legal assistant, a special assistant, and Jasmine Touré, who is the legal officer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this now concludes our proceedings. We have summarized the judgment, and uh, it only remains for me to thank the parties and participants, the interpreters and the court reporters. I also like to thank the registry staff for having facilitated this hearing. Thank you. The session is closed. All rise.